All right, breaking news. We are one hour away from just down the road at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. President Biden, one hour from now, gives arguably the most important speech of his life, certainly the speech that he believes will set up his legacy. Just receive part of what the president will say. Quote, the defense of democracy is more important than any title. The sacred task of perfecting our union is not about me. It is about we, the people. Uh, Based on this, those of you betting that he might resign tonight, the ultimate surprise, well, that's not going to happen. So rather than just look at it politically, there's other folks watching, right? Not just Americans. Our allies are watching. Our enemies are watching after we did not see the President of the United States for six days. He must reassure the country and people around the world that he can run the country for six more months. His vice president and the new presumptive nominee tonight will be watching the speech in Houston. Earlier, she gave a speech to the historical black college sorority Zeta Phi Beta in Indianapolis and thus missed the Israeli prime minister's speech to Congress today. You might say it was convenient scheduling. Pro-Hamas groups protested outside the Capitol and tore down the American flag at Union Station, then lit it on fire. They also talked about killing Jews and Hamas is coming. So this is the left wing of the Democratic Party. More protests possibly tomorrow at the White House when the Prime Minister meets with the President. Capitol Police finally restored order after a few hours of clashes. So we welcome you to the fairest show on television. And first tonight, President Biden does have a high bar for this speech because he has three roles in this speech. He is the Commander-in-Chief, he is the President of the United States, and he is also the Campaigner-in-Chief. All three of those roles tonight in one hour to set up his legacy. And throughout his time in office, somehow we've got incredibly used to not seeing or hearing from the president for very long periods of time. Six days passed before we saw him arriving at Joyce Bates Andrews following his COVID-19 diagnosis. It was unheard of in any other presidency. When Ronald Reagan was shot, there were pictures of him put out three days Later, remember, President Biden signed the letter saying that he was stepping aside and there was no picture. There was no photo op. For Biden and frankly, for the country tonight, the stakes couldn't be higher. We love talking about the politics of all of this, but at a higher level, the world is watching of what the leader of the free world is about to say. How is he going to say to the world and to the bullies around the world that he's in charge. Before he could even speak, Biden's White House press secretary hadn't held a briefing for nine days. Well, said the quiet part out loud about why he really dropped out of the race. It does not have to do, they have nothing to do with his health. In his letter, he talked about the country, he talked about the party, uh, he talked about the moment that we're in right now. Uh, It is not about his health. I can say no, that's not the reason. We'll see if President Biden addresses that issue. Obviously, Donald Trump, who's been on the stem, was talking about Joe Biden's health a lot. Maybe his health is the real reason, and they just won't say it. Maybe it's because polling showed he didn't have a path to victory, despite repeated claims from the campaign that he did. Or maybe it was because he was forced out by high-profile Democrats and donors who lost faith. We will read between the lines to see if President Biden calls any of those folks out. Was it really a coup. Regardless, the White House might come back to rue not being forthright with the American people about all of it, especially that now Kamala Harris faces so many questions about what she know and when did she know it. Very fair question. She hasn't given an interview, hasn't scheduled an interview since she was named, coronated as the DNC nominee. Same people who told us Biden could do cartwheels while negotiating peace deals are now saying that Kamala Harris spent the last three years crisscrossing the world, handling the most important issues of the day. Neither are true. It sounds obvious, but voters do not like being lied to. And in less than an hour, 
President Biden has the chance, now without an election on the line for him, to set the record straight. Our panel standing by, their analysis of the speech and Kamala Harris's first couple of days on the campaign trail. We begin with Kelly Meyer at the White House tonight, uh, where I, I think you could say as high as the expectations were for the debate, then for the press conference, they're even higher tonight. Yeah, Leland, and we actually just saw a lot of staff moving into the White House, maybe to watch this uh, themselves in real time as he speaks from the Oval Office. But the answer that you mentioned, the one that we're waiting for, is really the why, why he decided to leave the 2024 race. And as you were talking about, will this announcement be any kind of resignation? The president is expected to say tonight, over the next six months, I will be focused on doing my job as president. That means I will continue to lower costs for hardworking families and grow our economy. I will keep defending our personal freedoms and our civil rights from the right to vote to the right to choose. So sounding like he's going to be here for the next six months. Today, the White House Press Secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, faced a slew of questions around the question of why he dropped out of the race. Was it his health? Was it a cover-up by his of his decline by his aides? She said it had nothing to do with his health and that there was no cover-up. And when asked if he was bullied out of it, she judged that question. And Karine Jean-Pierre also says it is ridiculous to think he can't finish the term just because he isn't running again. She said the president will explain exactly what happened and what lies ahead. The White House doesn't see themselves as lame duck, they say, and that the president is going to do exactly what he was planning on doing even as he was running, but they said no new initiatives to preview for the months ahead. Leland. Okay. Uh, I guess they're entitled to their opinion when it comes to that. Uh, we'll see how that works out. Kelly, stand by with us throughout the hour. Obviously, we're going to be getting some new excerpts uh, and information. We'll come back to you there. Bring in the panel. Yasmi Raji, executive director of Swing Left. Kurt Bardella, democratic strategist, News Nation contributor. Scott Walker, former Wisconsin governor who ran for president in 2016. Obviously, Blake Berman, uh, chief Washington correspondent, back uh, doing double duty from the Hill, back also tonight uh, for post-game um, Yasmin, we'll start with you. Who are, give us a percentage. Commander-in-chief, campaigner-in-chief, President of the United States in tonight's speech. How's it break down? Uh, thank you so much for the question. Uh, I think what voters, my organization has been out knocking on doors before the debate, since the debate. They've been out uh, making phone calls. And what they are hearing from voters is what they are looking for, uh, both you know, in tonight's speech, but also uh, in these next critical 100 plus days, uh, is someone who is talking about the issues that people care about and the issues that we are hearing over and over again, uh, that we are hearing both the president and uh, our presumptive nominee talk about are the kitchen table issues like the economy, like reproductive freedom. Um, and we are just really grateful that they continue to lead on the issues that matter most to the American people. Bardella, I heard Kelly Meyer. We almost all chuckled out loud. Okay, <laughs> They don't see themselves as a lame duck. Who are they kidding? Uh, you know how you talked about the people, American people want honesty? Yeah. From the uh, th that's the kind of stuff that drives people crazy, frankly. I mean, he is a lame duck. But, and, and he made himself a lame duck. And, and, and I thought that was the right decision, almost a courageous decision. So why not decision. lean into it? And, and, and I hope that when he addresses the nation that he, he does exude some semblance of that reality. Uh, there is a clock now on the Biden presidency. He is a lame duck. And it's okay to now use the speech to talk about what your agenda is, what you want to use that time doing. But let's not kid ourselves now. Uh, y y there is this clock. There is narrowing influence as that clock goes on. Kamala Harris is now the de facto leader of the Democratic Party. That's just reality. You know, Governor Walker, I remember standing where Kelly stood mm -hmm. in 2015, and especially in 2016, because yeah. I covered the Obama White House. And boy, was it difficult to get on television because there was no news. The news was... The 2016 campaign for the right. Republicans, the news right. of the 2016 campaign right. um, for, for the Democrats. This is a little bit different. And we heard Donald Trump earlier talk very directly about Kamala Harris being far to the left, farther to the left than Joe Biden. Is there anything Joe Biden says in this speech today that somehow he takes responsibility for the past four years and tries to absolve Kamala Harris of it? No way. There's no, no way, no how. I mean, you had, this is the Biden-Harris campaign up until just a few days ago. Um, if anything, the president, former President Trump is right. You look back in the 2020 campaign, Newsweek magazine actually ranked her the year before she was on the ticket. It's actually further to the left 
than Bernie Sanders, who is an avowed socialist. So to say that she's radically to the left is pretty consistent with her voting record in the Senate. I think the bigger issue of all this, yeah, Joe, Joe Biden needs to come out and talk about why he got out. I hope it's an American first. It wasn't his health, uh, because I would feel sad about that. Uh, it was because of the polls, and not just because of a poor debate performance. Even before that, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris were in trouble, because in my state, prices are up 20 percent. Gas is up a buck and a quarter. You want to buy a house, you want to pay your rent, it's up nearly 30 percent more than four years ago. That's why they're in trouble before, and that's why Kamala Harris will continue to be in trouble now. Blake, getting more excerpts from the White House. Um, The great thing about America is here, kings and dictators do not rule. The people do. History is in your hands. The power is in your hands. The idea of America lies in your hands. How close is he getting to the kind of rhetoric that we were told 9, 10, 11 days ago inspired, may have inspired the assassination attempt. The the difference in rhetoric from Democrats has has been a shift from, quote unquote, threat to democracy to we need to protect democracy, right? So they've gotten rid of that word threat. And this is obviously a nod to to Donald Trump and the campaign going forward. Um, I mean, look, one of the things, so President Biden's going to speak tonight in quite literally an hour from now. He might take a, not might, he's going to take a victory lap as to how he sees the last three and a half years of his campaign, so on and so forth, but or of his presidency. But there's going to be real questions for VP Harris going forward, Leland, um, as to what, what you do you know. Well, that also, but on the issues, right? Like on, on Israel, there are the labor unions right now are saying stop weapon shipments to Israel. Vice President Harris, do you side with the labor unions or should we continue sending weapons to Israel? Right. That's just one of them. For example, Bernie Sanders, uh, it, you can read her Medium post when she was running for president. She wanted a 4% tax to pay for Medicare for all on households uh, with 100000 or more in income. Vice President Harris, would you still tax households at a 4% uh, rate, over $100,000 for do, Medicare for all? She would have all, to right? do an interview first. Before she's gonna we have to, to, and she's going to have to answer these questions at some point. You're right. Um, and look, we know, we know in the past when she has done interviews, even with relatively friendly news outlets, I'm thinking about the Lester Holt interview, uh, it didn't go, well. go so well. Yeah. Um, and she has not exercised that skill or gotten better over time because she hasn't been out there. Yeah, has been Trump holds now 49 percent support among registered voters nationwide to Harris 46. It's a new CNN poll that just came out within the polls margin of error. Um, and that's closer than Biden was in the polls. Uh, it was like 44, 43. What's interesting about this poll is they go back to the same panel every time they go back and ask the same people. So there's a trend in shifts. How does Kamala Harris make sure that what happened to her in 2020 doesn't happen again? And by that, I mean, in 2020, there was a time she was almost the front runner. And then she started campaigning and people liked her less. <laughs> How is that not going to happen again? Uh, well, first off, I think the, the range in the polls is something that I think we are all paying close attention to. It's been just a couple of days. Uh, we see some polls where she's up by four points, some where Trump is up by over, you know, over four points. So there's a lot of noise. Uh, the poll that I, I want to return to something that the governor was saying just around the issues that folks are caring about in the terms of the economy. Uh, to me, a really grounding poll that also resonates with what we've been hearing from voters every single day that we've been pounding the pavement is economy is the number one issue. And Kamala Harris and Donald Trump are tied on the economy. Voters, when, and when the questions are asked about where do these two candidates stand in terms of the prices, as the governor said, people care about the prices of their grocery bills, their gas prices. They see Kamala Harris and Donald Trump is tied. And so to your question of where's the opportunity for her to campaign, there is tremendous opportunity. The party is well, fired up. They're enthusiastic. Her, her, have... unfa- her favorable is at 37%. So there, you could argue there's nowhere to go but up for well, her. Well, and she just raised $100 million in record, uh, in record number of days. I keep, I keep hearing. I, I want to see. I, I'm, I'm going to be very interested to see the FEC forms on that, if that, actually, if that number actually holds. So I can't wait to come back. We'll right, talk yeah. about that. <laughs> I got it. All right. So we're going to wait for President Biden, obviously, uh, now 45 minutes away from his fourth Oval Office address. He's done two now in the past two weeks. Tomorrow, he meets with the Israeli prime minister after those massive protests in D.C. Why Biden's attempt to placate the far left, we'll see if he does it again tonight, is failing miserably. And new polling shows J.D. Vance is even less popular than Kamala Harris. Who can Kamala Harris now pick to take advantage of, well, perhaps buyer's remorse by the Republicans? Who is 
here, and I know, therefore, that we share a vision for the future of our nation, a future where every person has the opportunity not just to get by, but to get ahead, a future of social justice, health justice, economic justice. Social justice, health justice, economic justice. Vice President Kamala Harris earlier at a black sorority event in Indianapolis, while Harris speaks proudly of being a person of color, focuses on black voters, and her supporters, supporters relish in the idea, they talk about it often, of her being the first black Indian woman president, they don't much like when anybody else brings up her race or sex. They're running very scared. That's what I think. They're running very yeah. scared, and they have nothing else other than racism and sexism. It is overtly sexist and racist to say that by virtue of the fact that she's a woman and a woman of color, she's not qualified. Congressman Tim Burchett of Tennessee joins us. Good to see you, sir. Have you figured out, I know as a Republican, you guys are all kicking this around. What are you allowed to criticize Kamala Harris on? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. She's been a dismal failure as the they, you know, everybody called her the border czar, and now for some reason they can't say czar. It's offensive. She, um, you know, 14 million people have come over the border. She was put in charge of that by the president, by President Biden. Um, she was reminded on, on a TV show that she has not even been to the border, and she said, well, I've been it to Europe. And, you know, it, it's a joke, man. She... Um, I don't care what color she is. I don't care that she's a woman. She is terrible. She has failed at everything she's done since she's been in Washington. Um, the speeches she's given have been an embarrassment. You know, and people compare her to me. I'm a congressman, Dad Gummin. I'm not somebody who's in line. Were, were they were they trying to insult her? <laughs> yeah, I guess. I, I you know. It, every, <laughs> Hey, man, leave the comedy to me, okay, Leland? You're, you're an amateur, okay? You're an amateur. Um, yeah, I, and, and the point that she's at a sorority thing tonight, I, mean, I, I think that's great. Uh, black fraternities and black sororities are a uniquely united bunch of folks, and it's a, it's a real sisterhood, and it's a very, it, it's a very uh, tight-knit Let me group. Ask but, this... The, the, the one thing that could change this, right, is whoever her vice presidential pick is. Um, and, and they're looking to that to uh, she's got the progressive base, um, which she speaks to and which her issue set is now uh, firmly about. You point that out. Economic justice, social justice, health justice, whatever. Potential Harris VP picks. Senator Mark Kelly of Arizona, the astronaut. Roy Cooper, governor of North Carolina, one in a b red state blue governor. Andy Bashir, governor of Kentucky, one in even a redder state as a Democrat. Josh Shapiro, first Jewish vice president if he's elected from Pennsylvania. J.B. Pritzker, no chance from governor of Illinois. Pete Buttigieg. Uh, there you go. And here is, I guess you could say the dark horse because nobody's talking about it, but I'll put it up. Uh, Admiral William McRaven, he's the guy who led Operation Neptune Spear, the Bin Laden raid, and the Make Your Bed speech from the University of Texas. Which one of those, and you got to pick one, scares you the most as a Republican? I'd say Mark Kelly. Um, I, I mean, I know Why? who he is. I shook his hand today. He's an astronaut. He's, he's accomplished. He... Um, I think he's probably a cool operator. Those guys that do that are, um, it's not, they're not cowboys like they're portrayed. They're, they're usually mathematicians or something. And, um, and they're, they're, they're very intelligent folks. And I think that would, that would offset her completely. Um, right. so, so I, I, I think it's I, interesting. You've got a lot of flack. Uh, we don't need to play the, the soundbite, but you got a flack because you called the Harris, a DEI, the DEI hire. And there's an argument for that, right? Because Joe Biden laid out he was going to pick a black woman. When you lay out those criteria, making assumptions and, and hiring decisions based on something other than merit. So there's two sides to that story. But now when you criticized her, you went after her on the issues, on the border. You can also go after her on Ukraine, where she went over uh, two or three days before the invasion. She was supposed to be the one to lay down the law to Vladimir Putin at the Munich Security Conference. And Vladimir Putin thumbed, thumbed his nose at her. Uh, then there's the voting rights Thing. She was going to lead the charge on federal voting rights. Um, it blew up in her face when two Democratic senators 
uh, said no, no thanks after six months of work. Are Republicans better served by going after her on the issues than the cheap attacks? I, you know, I, I think so. I, I, mean, I don't care. Look, um, everybody's got to decide what they're going to do. Every time we say something, they're going to claim it's race. And, it, and really, it, it, to me, it's kind of an insult because when, when somebody truly is a racist, we've got Nazis out here. We've got people that are very bad people. Mm-hmm. But it's, it, it's, it's almost the chicken little thing. You know, they, they cry about it. And then when it really does happen, these Nazis and these dirtbags like that, then people just like, eh, you know, it just kind of falls yeah. off. So, I, and, you know, oh, on the DEI good. thing, though, but let me read you a quote from President Biden. Diversity, equity, and inclusion are the core strengths of America. I'm proud to have the most diverse administration in history. And he goes on to say, it starts at the top with the vice president. That's the president's own words. So why are they not threatening to censor Joe Biden? Why, are, why isn't some... Well, res- respectfully, report. Congressman, you could argue the fact that the Democratic Party just pushed out the president of the United States was them censoring Joe Biden. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. But, <laughs> but the reality is he said all these things and they celebrate yeah. it. And then when a when a conservative says, it, oh, it's racism, you know, that's bogus. No, look, it's an excellent point. And if everything's racist and everything's sexist, nothing is. Um, and there's real racism. There's real sexism. Uh, and it cheapens it. Um, so you, good point. And I uh, appreciate you bringing the quote. Uh, it helps when you have receipts. Uh, Congressman, it's good to see you, sir. Thank you. Leland, as always, keep putting the truth out there, brother. You, you have the second best hair on this screen right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm honored to be considered on the list, sir. We'll see you soon. Uh, yeah, we take I'm going to grow a mullet, the... I think, is what I'm trying to do. Because, you know, oh, it's Lord. A, Within a hairstyle, oh, it's a lifestyle. My campaign manager, Thomas Maxby, <laughs> has a mullet and a mustache, so there you go. <laughs> Congressman, um, you're like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get in these interviews. It's good to see you, sir. Thank you. Love we you, appreciate brother. it. See ya. <laughs> Live look at the White House. Kamala Harris, nowhere to be found tonight. It's interesting, right? She skipped Benjamin Netanyahu's address to Congress today. And she will not be there for the president's speech tonight. Could turn her back on Israel shield hairs from the protests that were getting ugly and could have been ugly outside the Democratic National Convention. Kamala Harris was in Indianapolis today as pro-Hamas protesters took over the streets of D.C. They chanted, Hamas is coming. They chanted they were going to kill the Jews, tore down and burned the American flag at Union Station as the Prime Minister of Israel spoke to the United States Congress. Here's another one spray painting, Hamas is coming, on a statue of Christopher Columbus outside Union Station. The Israeli Prime Minister He's been in town for a day. He spoke to Congress today. He meets with President Biden tomorrow. Axios reports roughly half of House Democrats and half of Senate Democrats skipped in solidarity with Palestinians. Among them, the Vice President of the United States, California Representative, member of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs, Representative Amy Barra, was one of the Democrats not at the speech. Congressman, it's good to see you. Thank you. Um, There was going to be a lot of issues inside the Democratic Party, especially at the convention, over President Biden's uh, support of Israel. The fact that Kamala Harris skipped today, is that enough for these protesters and enough for the far left wing to insulate her from those attacks and that anger? Not at all. Both um, President Biden, um, Vice President Harris, myself, we're all strong supporters of Israel. I've got some issues with how um, Prime Minister Netanyahu is prosecuting this war, but I would not um, take my absence there or the vice president's absence as supporting Hamas or the Palestinians. Hamas is a horrific um, organization. It's a terrorist organization, and I absolutely support 
um, is Israel's right to defend itself and dismantle Hamas. And you have the pictures of the protesters burning a flag, um, graffiti. There's no place for that in America. Peaceful protest is fine, but I didn't like what I saw by the protesters either. Oh, look, I don't, I don't know how you can be an American and like that, because that's not in favor of the Palestinians or for peace. That's, that's talking about violence and supporting um, genocide. But in, in a situation where there is a binary choice, either you go to the speech or you do not go to the speech, can't you understand how a lot of people who support Israel say that by not going to the speech and take, essentially taking the same position as the protesters, you're throwing your lot in with them, as did the vice president? Well, look, the protesters were taking a position of support for Hamas. I can only speak for myself. I do not support Hamas. My decision not to attend the, the speeches, I actually do care about Israel. But I also, in talking to the, the families, American families that have hostages held in, in, Israel, or in um, Gaza, we need to get those hostages home. And the one thing they asked me was, can you get a message to Prime Minister Netanyahu? This was a way to, to make that statement. We've got a so by tough, not, by toughly not negotiated going, ceasefire a deal on the table. Well, we've got a toughly negotiated ceasefire deal on the table. We ought to take that ceasefire deal. We ought to get the hostages released. Look, the Israelis have every right to go out and kill Sinwar, to go out and dismantle Hamas. But I think there's a better way to go about doing that. We also have been negotiating with the Saudis to recognize Israel. But that's been a tough negotiation. And yeah. I think it gets harder by the day. So my desire would be find a ceasefire, make sure Israel is protected and safe, Make sure we don't have a northern front that opens up. Make sure you know, we don't have the Houthis and, and others expand this war. Huh? And then uh, try to find that path forward. Look, I don't right. know what the future of Gaza is going to be like. I don't know what a two-state solution looks like. But we've got to think about a, a different path forward to secure okay. Israel, but also secure the region. All right. Fair enough. Uh, Congressman, thank you. We always appreciate you being here. It's good to see you, sir. Back now um, with the panel, Kurt Bardella. How dangerous is the far left of the party for Kamala Harris right now? Uh, I think just as it has been for President Biden, it can be a very big problem if they don't keep themselves in check. I do think it's worth noting contextually here that Kamala Harris is meeting with Netanyahu tomorrow along with the president. And also J.D. Vance, the vice president nominee for Republicans, wasn't at the speech today either. So I don't think her missing it is as big of a deal as it's being made out to. And Vance is also going to be meeting with Netanyahu with Trump as well. Like, they're all going to give the prime minister that time. Um, so that's not as much of an issue. But when people see images of far-left people burning the American flag, that's not going to help your cause politically. You know, I, I am a proud Democrat. When I see that kind of stuff, that drives me insane. When I see defacing statues, like, Democrats have spent since January 6th, a lot of time talked about, look how they used American flag on January 6th, like how destructive that was, rightfully calling that out, in my opinion. you got to call this stuff out, too, because that's just absolute garbage. Well, we heard the congressman call it out a little bit, Yasmin, but we have not heard President Biden, or certainly haven't heard Kamala Harris, anywhere nearly as strong as, as Kurt just alluded to. Why not? I've heard them denounce this kind of stuff uh, over and over and over. We heard them denounce any kind of violence during Black Lives okay, Matter. No, 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 no. We heard no, no, them no, no, denounce no, no. a told, lot of this stuff We were told during Black Lives Matter you had to call it out for what it was. You had to call things out individually. Same with January 6th. But when there's this stuff going on, all hate is bad. It's not about That's not what I've heard from a single Democrat. So I think, I think what's happening here, which is real, is there are real policy disagreements within the Democratic Party right now. That's real. And so I understand that Republicans and shows like this want to sort of spotlight those disagreements in a moment where there's actually tremendous unity in the party, tremendous energy in the party. But my folks, my volunteers have been out knocking on doors. Not a single person is talking about what's happening in the war in Gaza. They're talking about the economy. They're talking about reproductive freedom. They're talking about infrastructure. They're talking about the need for child care. So I totally get the line of questioning uh, and respect it. But I also just think, like, these are the policy disagreements that we talk about a lot in Washington. These are not the policy disagreements that any frontline Democrat for the House, for the Senate, and certainly not what, uh, what uh, the presumptive nominee Kamala Harris is going to be hearing from voters uh, every single day. I'll give you the last word, Governor. 
If, the, if this election is a referendum on high prices, border security, and public safety, Donald Trump wins because Kamala Harris's policies are Joe Biden's policies, and they failed the last three and a half years. And if it is a referendum on what, Donald Trump loses. Well, if it's on him, if it's just on personality, I, I think that's where the chat's where they tried to make it about four years ago by putting Joe Biden in the basement. They can't put Kamala Harris in the basement. They've got to have the head-to-head matchup, and that's why Joe okay. Biden was in trouble, which is why he got pushed out. Talk about a coup. There's a real coup, a guy who won every state's primary in the Democrat primary this year, not three and a half years ago. That's democracy that was pushed right out the door. Uh, set that aside and realize it's going to be about those issues. And that means it's going to be tight. It's going to be a lot closer than a lot of Republicans think. But I still think Donald Trump wins. I think everything just got a lot tighter. President Biden addresses the nation 21 minutes from now. And since he's gotten out, huge star power power has gathered around Kamala Harris. Who's coming to Chicago? The celebrities who are now all in. Listen carefully, you're going to hear that song a lot. Vice President Harris taking the stage to Beyonce's song, Freedom. That's her new walkout song, the anthem of the campaign, you might say. Donald Trump, Lee Greenwood's God Bless the USA. That's his walkout. His walk off now is Don't Stop Thinking About Tomorrow, same as Bill Clinton. Democrats have been the party of major stars in Hollywood for the last 50 years, which makes for good photo ops, campaign events. They don't always translate into votes. Just ask Hillary Clinton Here's the list who's already endorsed Kamala Harris. And we go George Clooney, Barbara Streisand, Mark Hamill. Those are the biggest names. There are so many more we couldn't show without our graphics department rebelling (laughs) against us. And I probably wouldn't know who half of those people are. In contrast, last week at the RNC, we saw Kid Rock, Hulk Hogan. I had a beer with John Rich. That was fun. All the huge stars, but not the combined wattage backing Harris. Anywhere close. Judy Kurtz joins us, reporter. The Hills in the know columnist and Georgetown University journalism professor. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, all right. Look, George Clooney was, our, was behind Barack Obama. He had a huge fundraiser for him. What's changed now with Kamala Harris? Absolutely. Well, I think it's like the opening box office weekend for Kamala Harris's campaign when it comes to celebrity support. It's like Inside Out 2 is opening. Avatar is opening. Everyone is, you know, all these A-listers are getting behind her uh, right from the get-go. George Clooney, who penned that devastating op-ed in the New York Times against Biden, who he supported, uh, backing Kamala Harris right out of the gate. So she's gaining a lot of momentum, a lot of support from Hollywood that Joe Biden had some of, but not to this extent, not this kind of energy that we're now seeing. Kurt, you, you, get, you know celebrities in the country music world, right? Um, we think about those who are endorsing Trump. Amber Rose, Hulk Hogan, Kid Rock, Dana White, Chris Jansen, Dave Portnoy, Elon Musk, 50 Cent, Steve Wynn, Jason Aldean, John Rich. Um, if we just look at this as a cultural divide in America between progressive cult values and traditional values, the celebrities kind of line up and do they not just cross each other out? Right. I mean, I think... Like Offset? I, 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 yeah. I mean, you look at the type of characters that are behind Trump and, and were sh- showcased at the RNC. That's that red meat flyover state, middle America, uh, that... There's more of a risk, to though, see. right, to Republicans coming out, or, you know, celebrities coming out for Republicans. And there's a risk oh, there's that backlash, because there's that group mentality in Hollywood, right, that, I mean, if you're not with us, you, know, you, you are part of the enemy. Hollywood's very liberal, left-leaning, of course, and so there's a lot of peer pressure there. In the country music world, it's, it's actually the opposite. Right. If you are, uh, let's say, Tim McGraw, who performed at Biden's inauguration, there's a lot more backlash there from that audience because it runs contrary to the culture there. So I do yeah. think it does kind of... Ultimately, can't so yeah, but is the is the the holy grail is Taylor Swift, right? <laughs> I don't know. Pop, I don't know a lot about pop culture, but I feel like that is that. Yeah, Biden's campaign was really co- trying to court her, uh, and I have a feeling that Kamala Harris's campaign is going to really be trying to land uh, that endorsement from Taylor Swift as well. Taylor Swift, I should say, uh, traditionally has endorsed right before the election. So I think if we get any sort of support from the Swift uh, fan base, it's going to be like right around October. Well, and here's why Taylor Swift matters more. Than- than almost any of the other celebrities, there is a direct cause and effect. When she does a call to action, register right. to vote, get involved, there's actually massive activity that happens. That Most celebrities, 
They do their thing. They're great on a fundraiser. They don't what was your, what, you had all. an idea for Taylor Swift. I know we're, we're, yeah. we're, tw- we're 12 minutes away from President Biden giving his I'm done farewell address, and we're talking about Taylor Swift. <laughs> but but it, it shows what can actually move the needle. This speech will not move the needle right. in the election. Well, my idea was if I were Taylor Swift and you want to move the needle, say I will hold free concerts in all the swing states, and all you need to get in is a, a I just register the vote card. Well, you know, a lot of campaigns have done that very well. I think celebrity, the engagement of celebrities at organizations like ours at Swing Left, does lead to more volunteers, more donations. We see that time and time again. And Taylor Swift has already engaged in this election cycle uh, with an organization called Vote.org, where she raised, uh, where she helped that uh, a huge number of people register to vote. So I think what we're seeing here is, I know there's a lot of FOMO in the Republican Party because a lot of the celebrities whose music they love, whose movies they love, are on the side of the majority of Americans who support issues like reproductive freedom, where 80% of uh, Americans yes, are yes, Democrats. This was the fun segment, okay? Yeah. <laughs> this, was the, this, this was the fun segment, okay? But uh, you said an interesting thing, though, okay, and that is you think about Joe Biden, who's in the White House right now, listening to whatever his favorite news channel is, realizing that all of a sudden he drops out, Kamala Harris comes in, you get $100 million, yeah. you get all of these celebrity endorsements, all of the things that he was hoping for to have, didn't happen. He drops out, um, and they all happen. We'll see how much regret there is in the president's voice and how much of it is looking forward. About 10 minutes away from the president of the United States, you call it his farewell address, his legacy address. How much is he the campaigner in chief when we come back? Minutes away from hearing from the President of the United States, his second Oval Office address in two weeks, his fourth of his presidency. So this is a rarity for Joe Biden, especially at 8 p.m. Eastern. Back now with Yasmin Rajdi, Kurt Bardella, Governor Scott Walker. Governor, in the break, you said something I thought was really important. The only endorsements that matter are the unexpected. Could we also say the only thing that matters in speeches is the unexpected? What's the unexpected tonight? Well, if he came out and actually said why he got got out of the race, I mean, I, I think if he said, no, I got pushed out, the polls are wrong, made some kind of bulwark moment where he just <laughs> said, I'm going to, I don't care, I'm going to say what it is. I don't think he does that. Uh, I think if anything, he's going to try and make the case, do a pat on the back, say we did a good job and give a tacit endorsement uh, of Kamala Harris. But it's a little, you know, too little, too late. So you want him to go Tim Burchett on us. Yeah, right. Exactly. Well, and I lead a group called Young America's Foundation. We did a poll of college students right before that debate. The economy was the number one issue and they were already about a three to one margin, not thinking that Joe Biden was connecting with them. So I don't see anything more he does to connect at this point, even by getting out of the race. Yeah. Ten days ago, we all watched before the RNC that that speech 30 hours after Donald Trump got shot, maybe 28 hours yeah. after Donald Trump got shot. And there was no connection no. just in, in terms of just the delivery. Uh, Politico, the most important speech Joe Biden will ever give. The president needs to be clear and candid, not just about why he made decisions to step aside, but why he believes he is fit to remain as president through the end of his term. Jeff Greenfield, contributing writer, uh, hardly a, a raging liberal in his uh, sense. Um, Yasmin, does it really, and I hate to say this because we're about to cover the president, but to Democrats, does it really matter what he says or have you guys all moved on? You know, I think this is a moment about the history books. Uh, I don't think it was uh, unintentional that his announcement was in presidential letterhead uh, because I think what he's thinking a lot about is his legacy. His legacy is as one of uh, the most impressive and uh, effective presidents who's going to leave a mark uh, that I think we'll look back on as uh, someone like FDR. So I think tonight is part of that legacy creation. He has passed the baton uh, to a candidate that has really unified the, co- the party in Kamala Harris. There is tremendous energy. And so I think, uh, you know, as you rightly said uh, from that political article, this is a moment that we are going to be reading about uh, for many, many years. And I think that is the primary thing uh, that is on his mind. Just to put a little finer point on that, I'm looking at the letter that he sent stepping down. It was on personal letterhead. It wasn't on, it does not have the presidential seal on it, maybe because it's a political yeah. s- mm. action, not a presidential one. But then, Kurt, he's doing this from the Oval Office. There, there is right. no more, there is no better backdrop and no better home field advantage. Yeah, and I think that's where he has to right. It, this is the speech that's in the, the Joe Biden time capsule. This is likely the last speech. So does he that reach, we will a, does he reach across the aisle? Is this, is this, does he become the 
the the president for all of America, or is he the campaigner in chief for I Kamala Harris? I think this is a speech that's bigger than any party, than any election that will last and extend beyond 2024. And I think that's the view and lens in which the speech is probably going to be written and delivered. I, I guess, Governor, though, from a Republican standpoint, is there anything that Joe Biden says that changes the race a little bit or changes how Donald Trump and J.D. Vance can prosecute the case against Kamala Harris? No, I, I mean, again, again, it's exactly what you guys just talked about in the rest of the panel, that it's going to be about him thinking about his legacy. I think most voters have moved on. They're now focused on what's the difference between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. And it goes back to the issues we just talked about, the economy, high prices, border security and public safety. Those are the things voters care about. And I doubt he's going to talk any great length about that. He's going to talk more about accomplishments and how he wants to be remembered. Maybe he'll take a page out of the books of someone like President Reagan, who gave one of those across shining the board. City on the, shining really. City on the Hill yeah. fa so farewell address. That. I hope you he can, does. You can, see, you can see two addresses, right? You could see this is the political address, and then you could see the Shining City on the Hill farewell address later. Um, over the next six months, I'll be focused on doing my job as president, continue to lower costs for hardworking families and grow our economy, keep defending our personal freedoms and civil rights from the right to vote to the right to choose. So as we speak, um, and I don't know if you guys have ever been there for the Oval Office addresses, but the president sits down in the Oval Office. There's a couple of cameras in case one goes down. Uh, there's a producer there that will cue him right. um, just about a minute and a half after um, the top of the hour. Real quick, guys, any guess on how long he goes? I think it's relatively short. 15 minutes? 15. Agreed. Not as long as Donald Trump did at the RNC. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good Lord, one. Lord help us all. Well, yeah, that, 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 that's a, I'll take the under on that bet um, at any time. And boy, you think about just what this has, the end of this 10-day or 12-day period that this has, has ended, starting with the assassination attempt on Donald Trump. We could go back further um, to the debate. The, the debate, debate itself, yeah. Yeah. I, do we ever stop? Does anything ever come? No. Yeah. It will just get crazier every day. I think there's going to be a lull, like, after the convention, before between the convention and Labor Day, there'll be a little bit of a lull, and we'll all be able we, to catch our can, breath. I hope so. We can, yeah, we can, all, we can all hope so. Okay, a couple of minutes now until President Biden takes uh, the television airways, and we can expect, based on what you said, uh, it seems a full-throated endorsement uh, of his vice president. Came out in the letter, we heard it, in the, and then we will hear it in the... Tonight, Chris picks up from New York. I'll see you tomorrow night.